In Genesis 48, Jacob, the father of Israel, in the course of blessing his descendants, identified the angel of the Lord as his God and shepherd, the one who redeemed him from all evil. He also identified the angel as the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, thus giving the passage a retrospective significance, which we saw was confirmed in the lives of Abraham and Isaac, where the angel of the Lord appeared and spoke to them and was identified both as God and someone distinct from God. That the angel of the Lord can be identified as God and distinguished from God presupposes and evidences personal plurality in the Godhead. The book of Genesis, then, the foundational book of the Torah and the rest of the Bible, thus establishes, along with numerous other passages which we've also looked at, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while the one and only God, is not a Unitarian or unipersonal being. Inasmuch as Genesis 48 is also a blessing that Jacob invoked upon his descendants, praying for his God and the God of his fathers to bless his children after him, its significance is not only retrospective, but prospective. It points forward as well as backwards. As we move ahead then from Genesis to Exodus, we shouldn't be surprised to find that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob reveals himself to Israel as their God and Redeemer, and that central to this revelation is the angel of the Lord, who is once again equated with God and yet personally distinguished from him. An example of this in the book of Exodus is found in Exodus 24, when the Lord summoned Moses to the top of Mount Sinai, where Israel was camped after their deliverance from Egypt through the sea. In Exodus 24, 1, it says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. As may be discerned from the prior context, the speaker in this passage is the Lord, which is Yahweh in the Hebrew text. However, as in other examples we've already seen, in telling Moses to come up the mountain to the Lord, the speaker, who is the Lord, refers to the Lord in the third person. While some may wish to write this off as a rhetorical device, there is a more significant reason, one derived from the context itself, and in exegesis, context is king, which explains why the Lord, why Yahweh, speaks this way. In the immediately preceding context, Yahweh had just spoken to Moses about the angel messenger, the Malak, that he was going to send ahead of Moses and Israel to lead them into the promised land. As in Genesis, this is no ordinary or created messenger, for his voice is to be obeyed, and he has the exclusively divine prerogative of withholding forgiveness and punishing rebellion, precisely because he bears the very name of God, Yahweh. In Exodus 23, 20 through 22, it says, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. In identifying the angel as the one who bears his name, for which reason the weal or woe of the nation depends on how they respond to him, we have at once a clear indication of both the divine nature and distinct personhood of the angel, and thus an account for the words of Exodus 24.1. Contextually, when the Lord summoned Moses up the mountain to the Lord, he was referring to the name-bearing angel who has the authority to forgive sins, punish rebellion, and demand absolute obedience. This name-bearing angel, or Malach, is without question the angel of the Lord who previously spoke to Moses from the burning bush when he was called to lead forth the nation out of their captivity to the Egyptians. In Exodus 3, it is written, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. 
When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. In verse 2, we're told it was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses. And in verse 6, he tells Moses that he is the God of his father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In identifying himself as the God of the patriarchs, the angel is saying the very thing about himself that Jacob said about him in Genesis 48. Moreover, later in the context, still face to face with the angel of the Lord, who was speaking to him from the bush, Verses 13 through 15 say, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. When he says, this is my name forever, he's referring to the name Yahweh in the Hebrew text, which is here translated as Lord. And in referring to it as his memorial name to all generations, further evidence is provided that the angel who was speaking to Moses from the bush is the selfsame angel previously identified by Jacob as his God and the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac. As the prophet Hosea said concerning the angel who appeared to Jacob at Bethel, Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his memorial name. So the angel of the Lord tells Moses that Yahweh is his memorial name to all generations, and Hosea in Hosea 12 said the same thing about the one who appeared to Jacob. And so, in Exodus 3, at the call of Moses, and Exodus 23, after Moses and the people departed from Egypt, we learn that it was the angel of the Lord who raised up Moses and used him to deliver the nation. Indeed, in Exodus 13.21 and Exodus 14.19, we're told that it was the angel of God who went before and behind Israel in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, defending them from the Egyptian army and delivering them through the Red Sea. And since the angel is, as he himself said in Exodus 3.15, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, and as the Lord said in Exodus 23.20, my name is in him, it follows that the book of Exodus, like the book of Genesis, teaches that there is a plurality of persons in the Godhead, a plurality of divine persons who affected Israel's redemption from Egypt and through that redemption made themselves known to Israel as the God of their fathers. While the God of the Bible is one, there are no other gods besides him, the one God himself is not an undifferentiated monad, but a unity of persons who share the same name, nature, and attributes, and are worthy of the same worship.